We're now at this interesting point in the creator community where everyone is seeing creators start businesses. Early on in my career, athletes couldn't really wrap their head around that. I realized that the YouTubers that had the biggest chance of longevity and success were the ones that had help. It feels like YouTube's in a weird place where everyone's just kind of copying each other. But it feels like YouTube needs a little bit of a reset in terms of what creators are successful and who's at the top. It seems like everyone's just chasing views and what they should be doing is they should be building depth of community because that's the ultimate goal, have a community that is fostered that will support whatever you do. I do know that I created Night because it's something that I want to do with the rest of my life. I think for us to be able to compete with the big agencies in the industry and the big management companies, it's going to take decades. Hey, welcome to the Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something. It is TCU's day. We are here live on Discord, 6 p.m. Eastern, every single Tuesday. And we are back with a full slate of guests we are extremely excited about so you can expect a new episode every single week with a guest we have an absolutely phenomenal one with us tonight even if you don't know who tonight's guest is you know who tonight's guest is we've spent full episodes talking about the aspects of creativity that are tangential elements to a sustainable creative process like how brand deals actually work why it's so important to offload responsibility to other people what existing in this slice of the online economy really entails. We've had a lot of requests and offers for guests to speak to those realities, but we held out for four years to talk to the person who we view as the best. Walking on as a wide receiver to the North Dakota State University football team, the Thundering Herd tells you quite a bit about Reed Duxer. Like Jerry Rice and Steve Largent, he wore the number 80. Walking on requires a level of initiative and commitment that very few people possess, and it means identifying a specific role that a team needs filled, and then doing everything possible to fill it. It's a really uncommon combination of resolve and threading a needle. Reed went on to work as an NFL sports agent before transitioning into working with Dude Perfect, and that's when he founded Night Media. Just a few years later, Knight's roster includes a veritable who's who of YouTube. Hassan Piker, Dream and Carl, TCU alumnus Jay Schlatt, and of course Mr. Beast. But it's not just jamming mobile game ads into otherwise excellent videos, it's burger chains and chocolate bars and actualizing the full potential of his creators' minds, building and maintaining the conditions in which creators can create. This is how it works. This is how it's always worked. From Cardinal Richelieu and Louis XIII to Henry Kissinger and decades of U.S. foreign policy, there's usually somebody, or a group of somebodies, who does the work you don't see that lets others do the work you do see. Every single day, Reed's DNA is all over the YouTube trending tab without ever being implicated in any of those crimes. In John Updike's 1960 New Yorker article about Ted Williams and his retirement from baseball, he wrote that gods don't answer letters. But perhaps tonight we can get one to answer a few questions. Kevin and I love football. He likes the Niners. I like the Bills. But we don't get to talk about sports very much in a professional capacity. So, Reed, what is the difference between football players and YouTubers? Yeah, I mean, first off, what what an intro. Um, I, I don't know how long it took you guys to write that, but it's phenomenal. And I, and I know you're a San Francisco fan. So, Trey Lance, like former North Dakota State Bison, um, plays for San Francisco. I, I actually don't watch football anymore, believe it or not. I know that's crazy to say because mm. I played college football and 23 years of my life just revolved around the sport, but I, I churned out. I like fell in love with YouTube and video games and this like nerdcore world that I, I say that I live in now and football is kind of in my past, but I did have the opportunity to work with a lot of NFL athletes and a lot of YouTubers. And there's a lot of differences between guys that play in the NFL and individuals that make videos on the internet. And I would say the biggest difference is the entrepreneurial aspect of wanting to start businesses, wanting to push boundaries. I never really saw in the NFL athletes that I worked with, they were so fixated on just playing the game that they love, which was football. And 10 months, nine months out of the year, that's all they wanted to do. That's all they wanted to talk about. And so we had a really hard time wrapping their head around something bigger 
And I think one of those things came with Richard Sherman, who is a client of ours who invested in a company called Body Armor. And at the time, I can't remember how much he invested. It was a small amount, like 100,000, 50,000, something like that. And he never really paid attention to the equity. It wasn't something that he ever talked about. It wasn't something that he brought up in conversation. And then it wasn't until the company actually exited that he started to realize how much money he was going to make from this liquidity. And so I I never really heard an athlete um, talk about that until that moment came where Richard actually then exited Body Armor. And so we're, we're now at this interesting point in the creator community where everyone is seeing creators start businesses, creators are starting to understand equity. Uh, but early on in my career as a talent representative, athletes didn't, couldn't really wrap their head around that. All they wanted to do was you know, lift weights, become a better football player, become a better steward of the game. Uh, and so it's, it's been an interesting challenge working with creators, and it poses a lot of different um, issues that come along with that. But it's, it's both of them have been very rewarding in different ways. But I'd say the one like key difference is like creators are much more entrepreneurial in nature. And I think it's also because they start their own businesses from nothing. Like most of them start making videos in their basement or with their friends. And then they build this business like media company out of nowhere. Whereas athletes, like they play a pre-existing game that's been played. They have coaches, they have structure. Uh, and so that's the one thing that's always kind of stood out to me about the differences between the two. That was such an amazing answer. What's funny is that Matt and I, we always try to start the podcast with sort of a a question out of left field a little bit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it goes kind of poorly (laughs) to be perfectly (laughs) honest, because the guest has like, is really (laughs) caught off guard. And uh, like, that was like a shockingly good answer to a super random question Two 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 complex one. Yeah. 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 One Richard Sherman, Stanford man. So like Mm -hmm. he's really smart guy really smart guy. I'm sure that he learned from that mistake and is now now has equity in like everything that he, that he deals with. Uh, the, the other thing is like, I, I could also see having known plenty of YouTubers over the years, a lot of them that, that really do just focus in on making YouTube videos and don't have the, the same level of like business vision and acumen that you describe. But I imagine that those type of creators are the ones that you gravitate towards and and end up obviously taking under your umbrella for night media are the ones that have that sort of passion for you know what's next these youtube videos are cool but what's next i think it's a mix i I think you'd be surprised when i met jimmy in 2018 this was not something that he was thinking about he wasn't going how do i build like a content business that then plays into like some commerce business that be then became feastables it was something that I kind of had to continually talk to him about is what what could we potentially build on top of this large media entity or this content that you're creating? And so I, I wish it was the case that every creator that we started to work with already had maybe an idea or already was thinking bigger. Most of them are pretty focused on, like you said, making content, making the best content possible, where my job has has become really important is like, then how what do you do outside of just the content or what can you build on top of that content? And it spanned a lot of areas. Like we have a Pokemon marketplace with Leon Hart called Rare Candy. Uh, we have a, uh, a mobile application with Mariah L- L- Elizabeth called Spark that's more around like creativity through art and, and, and things like that. And so we have a lot of different areas, but most of those ideas uh, we didn't really start with. It was like building the relationship, understanding their content, understanding their audience. And then we started to kind of throw out like, what could this business potentially look like? Or what could, what could we build for the audience that Leon Hart is like currently crafting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Matt and I were just talking like yesterday or the day before about the importance of working with other people and how, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the growth potential that anyone has, regardless of what business that they're in, is entirely reliant upon finding other people to work with paying them an amount of money they're happy to continue working with you for, um, Mm -hmm. and then uh, delineating responsibilities for them to go and, you know, take a ball and run with it. I I was listening to an interview uh, that you gave uh, in which you were describing the importance of uh, hiring a CEO and a CMO and all of these basic roles for something like Feastables, um, but you can scale that down to a, a person hiring an editor 
or just a thumbnail artist. So I, I would love for you to talk a little <coughs> bit more about that and how you've seen uh, just explosive growth potential by just, hey, let me work with this one one person, you know, throw them a few bucks a month, and then all of a sudden, all of these other things are unlocked for me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have witnessed this. You can't do anything by yourself, You're, or you can only get to a certain point as an individual before you need someone to come in, help either like you like at, a, at a content creation level is like help with editing, help with thumbnails, help with creative, help with production. Like there's so many different roles now in a creator's company. And this is kind of how we thought about this. Now, just going back, like say four to five years ago, when I started building night, I realized that the, the YouTubers that had the, the biggest chance of longevity and success were the ones that had help. Um, and, and I saw a lot of YouTubers like early on, like Gen 1, this is like 2008, 9, 10, 11, where it was like individual in front of a camera. Most of them get burnt out. Um, they struggle with creativity of coming up with new videos, of reinventing their content. And what I realized was we needed to surround these creators that we represent with good people. And so it's the reason why we have individuals inside of Night that are just scouring the internet for good editors, and good production people. And then we'll plug them into these like systems that these creators already have. And if they don't have a system, we've done a good job of helping them build that or what that can look like and what a what an actual like individualized, which we kind of say like media company looks like and like what are those pillars that you need to hire. So we we knew this was important. And it's it's, it's just like taking Mr. Beast, for example, it would be hard for us to do Feastables and Mr. Beast Burger and all these auxiliary companies if Jimmy didn't have a bunch of help on the content side. Because trust me, like I saw how hard it was early on when I met Jimmy. It was just him and Chris and a part-time editor. And so he wanted to film all these crazy videos, but he didn't have anyone to help. And so it ended up being Chris and myself and Jimmy trying to pull together logistics to do these videos. And so I knew that taking the next step of his career, which was eventually building a business, would never happen without having an amazing team behind him. And so it's always been a core focus of ours is like, how do you get the creators the most help possible to be successful before you start thinking about and launching all these auxiliary businesses that come after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Are, 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 I was wondering if you had any specific advice that you like to give to small creators, because, you know, once you're on the level of Mr. Beast and now you're thinking, OK, how do I get chocolate bars in Walmart? Well, that's like a really different question than, yeah. uh, you know, how do I get out like two videos a week instead of one? So uh, yeah. do you have advice for like the up and comers who, who are the type of people really who listen to and support? a podcast like this. Yeah, the beauty, right? Like for me, and this might be crazy to, to say this, but in my, from my perspective, it's never been a better time to be a content creator. The amount of monetization opportunities or alt monetization opportunities and places where you can post content and like get seen or organically grow has never been better ever, right? So, and, and also with everyone really leaning into short, short form content, whether that's TikTok or YouTube shorts or Instagram with reels, it's never been a better time to figure out what type of content you want to make and just post it on the internet. I've seen so many different niches of content pop up on TikTok that have then been parlayed into like a commerce business or a YouTube channel or whatever that is. And so for, for my advice, and I get this question all the time is like, where do I start? I would start with where's your passion and what content do you actually want to create or what content do you think you'll still want to be creating in two to three years? Because a lot of people chase money, which is never the way to do this. Um, I think like three years ago, a lot of people just chase Fortnite. Oh, Fortnite's popping off. It's the most popular video game in the world. How do I make Fortnite videos on YouTube? And what a lot of them realized a couple of years later was, yeah, I'm doing well, but I hate the videos I'm making. It's like, isn't what I want to do. And so step one is like, figure out where your passion lies and what you want to create. And then step two is like, really lean into where the platforms are leaning into, which is short form content. And I would say, Focus your time on TikTok and YouTube Shorts. Do that because you're going to organically build an audience if the content is good, and then parlay that into like figuring out how you make long form video and then monetizing it. But I, I I say this a lot: like it's never been better to be a creator because now there's so many different ways to make money doing it. Um, like yesterday, I like found a TikTok channel who only cleans homes. He has like this power washer and he just power washes homes all day, and it's popping off. It does really well on TikTok. So it's like anything, anything can go off on TikTok. Any type of content can get views. And so I hope people realize that now. It doesn't matter if you fill a vending machine 
or if you work on a farm and maybe like this month you have to like seed or cultivate or whatever that is, there will be an audience and people will find this because the organic reach of shorts and TikTok is just that good. Uh, so in years past, um, I did some I did some seminars in different places, New Zealand, Australia, for very beginning creators. And there's a segment of people who start who, uh, for them, it, the pendulum has swung so far away from creation. And, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking in detail about their brand before they've even made any videos. How do you pull those people back? So it's like the opposite scenario of what we're talking about, where... You know, how do you take a pure creator and then get them into this this business uh, that's sustainable and then expand it? Is there is there hope for those people to rein them in? Because when I talk to them, they're like, what do you think my next step should be? Every time I said to them, like, talk to people here at this event, find a creator who who you'd like to help because your mind is in a different place than uh, actually making content. You should be helping somebody else make content, you know? Um but how do you mm -hmm. how do you deal with that situation? Yeah, I've dealt with it a lot where content creator so here's the thing that I've seen multiple times is creator has a lot of success early on in their career and they eventually again hit this like wall where they can no longer pull views because maybe their content's a little bit lost in the past, they haven't been able to reinvent or creatively they just have some fatigue and they don't have help. Those people usually make amazing employees. Um, especially for someone who's like on their way up as a content creator who needs that expertise that that person's like been through tough times. They understand some of the issues. And when they take a step back from being the talent themselves, they can put themselves in the shoes of like, okay, now I just need to think about creative ideas and concepts, or I just need to focus on production. And we found a lot of success. Uh, in a lot of our creators from taking YouTubers that had decent careers, maybe got to 100,000, 200,000 subscribers, and then, you know, unspeakable or somebody found them, convinced them to stop posting on their channel and hired them as a full-time employee. And so I, I think it's just, it's also a byproduct of how much opportunity is available in the creator community right now. Almost every creator on our roster is hiring, hiring editors, hiring production people, logistics help. Every single one is hiring at the moment. And so the only road to success in the creator economy is not to be talent. There's a lot of roads to be successful. <laughs> I, I never wanted to be talent. I think now I'm like doing podcasts and I'm talking about it because hopefully this will help the next generation of creators get this little nugget that needs to, they need to hear to be successful. Um, but I was never the in front of the camera person and I never wanted to be that person, but I knew that there was opportunity on the business side of this world. Uh, and that's just the start. There's a lot of opportunity across the creator economy that I hope people take advantage of. And we're, um, we're working on a company right now internally that we've been wanting to do for a while that's going to address one of these problems of hopefully aggregating all the creator opportunities and jobs into one singular platform where YouTubers can go on and artists can go on and share their thumbnails and their edits and like everything is there. I think that product needs to exist so people understand that like, oh, the only route to be successful is not just to be a creator. We tried to go into this when we we sat down with uh, we did an episode with our producer because he's a real young guy who's been with us for a long time, Ben, and and slowly you know built his skill set and uh, he's doing great things now, and he's one of the the rare young people who's like yeah I want to be the number two. I want to be the right hand man. I want to arrange everything. I want to do the production. I, I don't necessarily want to be the on camera talent. And there's there's so few people, you know, I am, uh, very happy in my role as, as being a number two. I love it. I love it. And if honestly, if Kevin gets hit by a bus tomorrow, I'll be able to get another job. Yeah. You know, <laughs> hopefully it, that doesn't happen. But yeah. <laughs> and I, I won't have no. to worry about a job a and you won't have to no. worry about a job. No. So win, win, but, but, but that's, um, you know, that's a nice reality on this is that, you know, like you said, everybody's hiring editors and producers and they, there are always creatives who need help creating. Yeah. This is, is it's a, a never ending flow of opportunity. Think, think of, um, the other thing too, is like, think of how many conversations you two have had where Kevin, maybe you've been struggling with something and you need a, a fresh perspective from someone that understands the struggle because they're in the daily battle with you. You don't get to have those conversations with people if you don't if you don't have employees that are in that world. And a lot of times, like 
And I, I have this problem too. I can go to my parents. I can go to my sister with issues. They're going to be like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So it's like hard for me to give you advice. But you two like live in, live in the same you struggle. And so I'm sure that it's a constant like communication of like, how do we handle this? What should we do here? And you're getting good feedback loops. And Jimmy and I very much have that. Um, I think I'm also not afraid to tell him no. And like, this is a bad idea. Uh, but you need those people in your life to be a creator or else you just kind of float away and you live in your own little world and you don't know if like you should be making that video or not posting that video. And so it's, it's so helpful to have a team of people who are on this, this ride with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A sounding board is, is, is invaluable uh, with, with all of this stuff. And, and also, like you said, somebody who's willing to say no, because all creative Somebody people. Somebody you can trust and be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Those two things, trusting them right. and having them be honest with you, that's that's critical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just I just was going to say that all creative people, whenever they have a new idea, think that it's the best idea in the world. And it's super helpful to have somebody else be like, that kind of sucks. I mean, there, there's, yeah. I, I know being, be, having done this for so long, I'm now at the point, this is so funny, where I will have some idea I think is the greatest idea in the world. I'll tell it to Matt, but then I'll also caveat by saying, um, I'm kind of manic about this right now. I'm not going right. to, I'm not going to pull the trigger on this. Um, I'm going to sleep Take that into account. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. going to sleep on it. And then tomorrow <laughs> I'll think about it. And, and tomorrow me will have a better <laughs> sense of whether or not this is a good idea than today. Me who's like wrapped in the whirlwind of being excited about it. Mm-hmm. I see it all the time. Uh, and most creators are they, they have a lot more success when they surround themselves with people who share in that same excitement around a channel or the content. And so, yeah, it's a, a, I guess another word of advice for a lot of people that are trying to start out is like, um, find help. I think you can, you can get to a certain point by yourself, especially in short form content. You can make comedy videos, whatever that is. But eventually, you're going to want someone who shares in this passion. And that could be a manager. It could be an agent. It could be a producer. It could be your CEO eventually. I, I don't know. Uh, but that that is something that I think a lot of creators need right now is just someone that's in this daily struggle that they're in. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the dragon's treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler pack you'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, you'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. Uh, One thing I wanted to circle back on, because I've heard you talk about this before, and I sort of wanted to push back on what you were saying, so I want you to elucidate it a little bit Mm -hmm. better, and that has to do with uh, the short-form content, which you you called swipe content, which is a term I never heard before that I absolutely love. That's that's a great term. That makes a lot more sense to me than than short-form, because... you can make yeah, a good. you can make a sixty second. I mean, back in the day, we had five second films. I don't know if anybody remembers that. That was pretty short, <laughs> short form on YouTube. But um, with the swipe content, you came to a conclusion that Matt and I came to uh, last year at VidCon, which was that the TikTok creators have a paltry hardcore audience compared to what we're used to with YouTube creators. And we and Matt and I talked oh, yeah. about this. Uh, we did like a VidCon wrap-up podcast when we got home. Mm-hmm. I think after, actually, we recovered from having COVID, from getting home oh. from VidCon. Yes. After that, we did yes. a podcast uh, talking about how uh, people really didn't show up 
for the TikTokers, not like, you know, lines out the door for for YouTubers in the past. So that spoke volumes to the to the two of us about how uh, it's clear that the relationship between an audience and a creator on we'll, we'll just call it swipe content and that of YouTube is dramatically different. And it seems really hard to build a business if nobody really cares what you have to say and you're just sort of this like ephemeral entertainment for 25 seconds until you, you see the next craziest thing you ever saw of like a dog uh, dunking a basketball. So what would you say? Like, how do you parse? <laughs> how do you parse? <laughs> did you, hold, hold on. Did you, did you just uh, like make peak content out of Air Bud? Yeah, I don't know why oh Air Bud is the greatest thing I can think of <laughs> off the top of my head. But um, it was also the dog from Full House, mm -hmm. I believe, by the way. A little bit of trivia. Oh, same dog? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Huh. Comet. Um, so how do you parse? <laughs> Get yeah. Back to the, the actual question. Uh, being able to get 100 million views easier than ever on TikTok with that actually meaning anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great observation. And I, I stand to my idea around swipe content that it's really hard. And, and I'll give you an example. So Jimmy and I, we were at VidCon. Um, TikTok had a party that night. And it was like, hey, we're inviting 300 TikTok creators. Jimmy and I went. Uh, and I remember him and I like entering and we were like, oh, we recognize that person. Oh, Jimmy, do you remember like seeing that TikTok from that person? We didn't know a single person's name, but we could identify them because we're like, we've watched that person on TikTok before. I just have no idea what his TikTok is. That is a, <laughs> that is a big problem. And it, it's a little bit with like, again, swipe content is like, you have my attention for three seconds and I'm gone. Therefore, it's like, I'm not going to be able to identify what your channel name is. This is like the, the, the beginning of this. I think that there has been creators that have figured out how to parlay a short form audience into people that are then interested in watching longer videos. So I think it's like, as much as I say, focus on short form video, because I think it's an amazing place for organic growth. I will then say, make sure you then figure out how to transition those people that they will actually care about watching a four minute video, then a six minute video, then a 12 minute video, because there is, I've seen people do it. I think um, one of the best examples is Mr. Ballin. It's like one of the biggest storytellers on YouTube. John started on TikTok. He made one minute storytelling videos on TikTok, was able to then transition a lot of people from TikTok to YouTube into that storytelling genre and had a lot of success and is still having a lot of success. That will continue to happen. I'm not convinced it's going to happen for people that dance. Um, and that was kind of gen one of TikTok was like viral dancing people like wanted to watch it, but then they were on to the next thing. I'm seeing a lot of business storytelling. I'm seeing a lot of like comedy. I'm seeing people that are making interesting short form content. And some people are either driving to Twitch, they're driving to YouTube. They, they understand that like, I need to, I need to take advantage of the organic growth on TikTok, but ultimately it's all about how do you grow on YouTube and make long form videos and YouTube shorts could end up just being the like quicker way to do it. Um, because Six months ago when YouTube Shorts went live, how it worked was if, if you guys would watch a YouTube Short and you would subscribe to that channel through that YouTube Short, you wouldn't get fed its lo that long-form video from that creator. You would just continue to see their shorts. That's Which now drives me insane. Yeah. It drives Same. me insane that, that, they ever, that that was ever a thing is in incredibly ridiculous. It's insane. I think they think that was a good idea. They, they basically... Um, de-incentivize people to make shorts early on because you didn't want to make shorts because it would basically give you subscribers that would never see your long form videos, which is not what you want. Um, thankfully that has changed. And so we're starting to see some individuals gain traction. I think Jong is like a good channel to look at is like gained a lot of traction through shorts. Now is averaging over a million and a half views of video on long form. So creators will start to figure it out, but without YouTube shorts and TikTok. I don't think Jong is in the position he's in because he wouldn't have seen that crazy organic growth that he got from shorts on the platform. Mm -hmm. So, and I was at VidCon. I saw Charlie D'Amelio room was pretty empty as I'm sure you guys saw. And then, yeah, um, yeah, there crickets and tumbleweeds. In yeah. There. And then Tommy in it and George and some of the like dream S and P guys go on 30 minutes later. And there's a line that can't get into the auditorium. <laughs> Cause like the, the, the room's already full. Right. So it's like, I, I, I figured this would happen. It wasn't talked about enough. Um, I, I'm not sure why this wasn't a bigger story of like, okay, we're having a really hard time with TikTokers building fan loyalty and community. 
Um, but I, I still stand to that. I think you know, ninety percent of the TikTok channels are having a really hard time building people that care about them. But the, the good ones are starting to figure this out, and they they get that. It's like this is literally the top of funnel for something for a much bigger opportunity in a long form video format. Yeah, real real quick, uh, I was on a panel on the main stage for Science Creators. And the room was full and, and, and we were so excited. We're like, oh my gosh, like, look at all these people that came out to see us. This is so exciting because a lot of the other uh, panels that I was on, uh, that, you know, this past VidCon were pretty, pretty sparsely attended. They were all waiting for the Minecrafters after us. So we, we were the panel before all the Minecraft kids. So it was all these, you know. Uh, like 13 year old girls who were just sitting there waiting uh, for us to leave essentially so they could see Tommy and uh, Jack Manifold and whomever else. <laughs> I, um, I was invited to speak at a Walmart conference a couple months ago and I was on before Emma Chamberlain and I walked in the auditorium is full of 19 year old girls and they're all going nuts. And this guy started asking like businessy questions and I was like, oh, let me stop you right there. Nobody in the room cares about that. I was like, let's talk about <laughs> like, let's talk about Emma a little bit. And then I'm going to get the hell off the stage because she's standing right there. And I know everyone here wants to see her. So I totally get it. Um, and yeah, it was wild when she walked in. Talk about a person that's grown an amazing community of fans. Uh, I've, and I wish you would have spoken at VidCon because then people would have saw the difference. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a lot of like Emma, like hardcore Emma Chamberlain fans out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about about um, managing all of these different types of people because I, I was Kevin and I were talking the other day about I, I can't even remember which uh, big scandal was overtaking Twitter, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But um, <clears throat> you know, somebody behaved badly or something like that, and it, really for the first time ever, like in human history, uh, do we now expect? artists and creators to be good people as well. This has really never been in, been much of a thing. Like 50 years ago, if you were managing a musician, uh, you know, it's like, please don't murder somebody. And if you do, we'll figure it out. Uh, now it's a lot more delicate. And there is this expectation that it's not just what you're creating. Uh, and we're seeing this with the, the Hogwarts legacy issue with JK Rowling, where, where people are really factoring in how they feel about her to uh, Hogwarts legacy. What is that like to be in the management capacity when you, you have to be cognizant of two things, the, the business and the creation side, but also the, the human side of it, where the bar is, is quite a lot higher mm -hmm. than it used to be. Yeah. It's, you kind of question every single decision being made. Um, and I, I think mm -hmm. Jimmy and I are very paranoid about this is like, even with, um, feastables is like, we questioned everything from, are people going to make fun of the packaging? Okay. If this QR code doesn't work, like are people on Twitter going to freak out and be like, you know, we potentially are scamming people. And so, yeah, we're, we're really hypercritical of all these things. And it's probably the, the one thing that stresses me out the most is like you, you rethink things so many times because you're like, I, how's the, how's the internet going to respond to this? Um, from like down to the chocolate and like, what are the ingredients? And like, okay, well, we have to put this ingredient in there, but like hopefully six months from now we don't, but we know the internet's going to freak out about it. Like all these different things that you have to take into account. And we saw this with Mr. Beesberger firsthand is like, we had, we had anticipated it was going to be pretty crazy the first 48 hours. I don't think we had thought it was going to be as crazy as it was. I and mean, we had hundreds of cars at like LA locations just waiting outside to get hamburgers and then restaurants were running out of buns and there was no community support. And so it's like mostly Jimmy and I on Twitter messaging people saying, Hey, we just checked on your order. It's going to be an hour late. We ran out of buns. Someone's running to Whole Foods. Like it was just a mess. Um, and you know, we had done a lot of thinking before the launch of like what could go wrong. Um, running out of buns was not on our list of things that could have went wrong. And so, yeah, it's, it's really tough. Everything is so scrutinized right now because it's everything is in the public eye. I mean, it's even like you guys said, like scandals, like the, you know, everything I show speed does is like talked about on the internet, right? If he says something negatively, or if he does something negatively at an event, uh, it's kind of the beauty and the curse of the internet is like everything is out there. Whereas 35, 40 years ago, like an actor, actress, musician could have done something stupid at an international event and nobody would have ever heard about it. It may have been on 
local news, but that would have never went national and been picked up. And so, yeah, it's, I mean, I definitely lose sleep over the fact that like at any moment, someone could say something and the internet could go wild and they could try and cancel someone. And, you know, I think for the most part, most of the people, if not all the creators that we work with are pretty highly vetted by us. Um, We have a pretty high bar for like who is represented by this company. And so we've had, you know, certain issues in the past and things that have come out. And I think we've done a good job of handling it. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't envy a lot of creators that are in the public eye. Every, every decision they make is judged by everyone on Twitter. And I, and that's not going to stop. I think it's like, if you want to be the stature of a Mr. Beast or a Logan Paul or an Emma Chamberlain, it's just something you have to live with now is like, there's going to be people out there that hate every single thing that I do. I'm just hopefully going to have to look past it or like make sure that every time I launch a new product or put up content that it's being, you know, highly vetted by my team before things go up. So yeah, I, I don't see this ending and it's something that's really, I think really hard for creators and it's, it's feeding into the whole creator burnout thing because you can only look at hate comments so much before it really just like hurts you deep down where like you kind of say, why am I, why am I doing this? Every time I upload people just absolutely make shit comments about it. Uh, and so I feel, I feel for a lot of the creators, but it's definitely not changing. Uh, Kevin, can I put you on the spot and <clears throat> ask you to just briefly explain, uh, the YouTube field day you did and, and, and also how you chose the, the pizza for the pizza video, because both of those things seem to, to fit what Reed is saying. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even remember the pizza people long time. You remember yeah, choosing the toppings on the pizza because you you know if you use pepperoni, you're going to get some comments from from uh, you know vegan types who are upset about this and using food at all because you're you're essentially wasting food to make this content. Like we went through every possible negative reaction to mm-hmm. to the pizza video. Oh, for the the um for the pizza theorem video. Pizza theorem. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. I thought you were referring to the short film that I did for field that field day channel. The well, after that first. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's the negativity. Yeah. No. 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 I mean, none of this is is that interesting. The 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 the, the funniest part about the pizza theorem video was that uh, I put a book on like a hardcover book on top oh, of a pizza, yes. uh, which was a oh. cool. Which was <laughs> yeah, Matt's, <laughs> Matt's like falling out of his chair over this. Uh, I got so many furious comments from people because I put this hardcover book on top of this pizza, uh, Mm -hmm. having, you know, thereby desecrated it or uh, ruined it. Yeah, which none of that happened. The the pizza was fine. It took me so long to make. The book was fine. uh, That's what I meant. I meant to say the book was fine. (laughs) The pizza and the book were both fine, just so everybody understands. Just just to send the record clear for all those comments. (laughs) It was fine. Yeah. Yeah. But the hysterical part about it, well, there were there were many levels of like absurdity to the anger and outrage over this. One is that it was it's such an obscure book that no one even knows it existed anyway. So it's not some like beloved it's like if this book vanished, zero people are crying about it. So yeah, you I, weren't desecrating the Quran. I mean, no, that's, that's <laughs> yes, yeah, it yeah, wasn't it, a religious text. It was a math book from yes. like 60 years ago. Uh, the pizza was <laughs> stone cold because it took me so long to shoot the video that it's not like it was this warm, gooey, piping hot, greasy pizza. It was like a piece of cardboard. And uh, and nothing. And I did it for like a, a split second because I thought it was funny. No one else thought it was funny. That This is like one of the, the very... Uh, illuminating things for creators out there is uh, you never know how people are going to react to the things that yep. you do. Uh, you know, you think something is hysterical and everyone else thinks that it's totally sacrilegious, but um, uh, that's part the of two the greatest fun. tragedies, two greatest tragedies in literary history were the, the destruction of the library of Alexandria and Kevin putting a book <laughs> on a pizza. That's right. That's, that's what we learned from that. <laughs> from that video but also that time when you dumped 100 potatoes little potatoes on the table and somebody uh paused the single frame and counted the potatoes to show that one of them had rolled off the desk and left a comment about how actually he was only dealing with 99 potatoes and they weren't wrong they were right but when that happened that's when we realized it's possible for every single phrase every word every frame of a video to be analyzed. Mm-hmm. And if they're going to think about it, uh, it's it's not so much guarding against disaster. It's We have to get on that granular level of a viewer because if it's important to them, 
it should be important to us. So we try not to obsess about it, but we, we factor it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the hard parts of being a creator is like, then you think about every second of every video and everything that's said in that video and like how that's going to be perceived from the consumer who's watching the video. Uh, and so again, it's, it's a tough spot that the creators are put in. I mean, they, they have amazing jobs. They get to create content for a living. It's just, they have to be hyper, I think, critical of themselves and what they say on camera. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. So, uh, uh, there's, I want to do a little bit of a topic shift here because I want to get to this because it's a, a thing that I'm like kind of obsessed with. And quite honestly, a lot of it is uh, fueled by Mr. Beast, not just Mr. Beast, but a, a lot of people, a, a handful of creators that we've actually had on this podcast, like Michael Reeves, William Osman, I did a thing, Alan Pan. Um, these all, are people all, ch who, all channels that need to upload more videos, by the way. So if any of them are listening, I want more videos from you guys. <laughs> Well, maybe the resources at Night Media can can help them out with that. You got to suck yeah. them into your universe. Um, but I'm obsessed with the idea of this hive mind, hive mind of creators making all the ideas and us running out of like viably awesome YouTube videos to even make. Because I know that you know you spoke about how when Jimmy made the um, Squid Game video. All of a sudden, it's like, well, how in the world do I top that? Because I always have to be progressing. I always have to be raising the bar. But at what point At what point has the bar sort of peaked? And not only that, uh, Matt and I did a podcast and a half, really, about my obsession with this because I genuinely think that there's a finite number of like viably awesome. Oh, this was the other thing I wanted to mention that supports my hypothesis here was when you spoke about how Jimmy scrapped the visiting the seven wonders of, of the world video, oh, yeah. which mm -hmm. is an amazing video idea. Yeah. Visiting all seven Great. wonders Great. of the world. In 24 a, hours. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. an S tier YouTube video idea that never saw the light of day because he couldn't come up with a good enough thumbnail for it. So when I talk about how there's like a finite number of amazing YouTube video ideas, these are the types of things that I'm talking about. So what are the conversations like for you and Jimmy and your other creators about at what point is it three years from now? Is it 10 years from now? Is it right now? Are we just kind of treading water with these kind of like outrageous great YouTube video ideas? Yeah. YouTube, it also feels like YouTube's in a weird place where everyone's just kind of copying each other. Um, and so it's, it's a little, I guess, uninspiring from my vantage point, just seeing a ton of creators film the same videos a, a little differently. Right. But I, I, I find entertainment in a lot of content that doesn't have virality. So it's like, I watch new rock stars. I watch like channels called the deep geek. Like I watch things that interest me, which is like Marvel, Lord of the Rings. Like now the last of us came out. I want to watch breakdown videos of that. And so that stuff will always exist. Um, I think those channels will pull 500, a million, maybe 2 million views a video. But if you're talking about like, hey, the bar is 50 million views per video. Yes, like eventually there's a law of diminishing return where it's like you can only give away a million dollars so many times before people don't want to watch that video. Jimmy, Jimmy is posting a video in a couple weeks that I think is a it's a different speed. Uh, it's not it doesn't have to do with giving money away. It doesn't have to do with a challenge. It's more of like a feel good. Mr. Beast video that he's been wanting to do for a while. 
I hope this video performs well because then I think it will show him that he doesn't have to make the same videos that he made in 2020 and 2021. He can step a little bit outside of that bubble and film things that maybe don't have as much virality, but are still amazing stories that people want to see. And so, yeah, I, I am a little worried about the current situation with YouTube because when I go on the trending page, I see a lot of the same videos and, you know, the hide and seek videos and challenge videos that have been done, you know, since 2018. And so, it is a little, but the hard part is creators are still pulling views on those videos and they're making a lot of money. So they're incentivized to continue filming those videos because they continue to pull the views that they want. Um, but it feels like YouTube's at a place where it needs a little bit of a reset in terms of what creators are, are successful and who's at the top. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, Jamie and I talk about this a lot. It's like, where, when, do, when does it end? Like, how, how do you, and this was something that we talk, spoke about at, after Squid Game. How do you, one up Squid Game. Like, where do you go from here? It was the reason that, I mean, Jimmy really didn't upload for a while after Squid Games. It's like, ugh. if the expectation is that, like, where do you now go? And I think he's done a good job of <laughs> like resetting his expectation and mindset of like, well, okay, well, now what does the future of this channel look like? And what are the ideas that we're filming in 2023? But like, that, that was a tough moment, I think, for all of YouTube to have to grasp. It was an amazing moment in that it was probably one of the biggest YouTube videos to ever be posted. But at the, at the other point, every creator was going like, the, the bar just got set so high, I don't know what to do, right? And so, I don't know. I, I'm, still, I'm still excited by every time I log onto YouTube and look at my homepage. But my homepage isn't you know creators making the same videos. It's like very interesting, deep topics. It's like, I think the science space is so unique and interesting. Um, I think the farming space is really interesting. I, the automotive space. So there's a lot of areas of YouTube that are really gaining a lot of traction in, in what I would say is like niche categories. Um, and even technology, Marquez Brownlee, uh, Mr. Who's the Boss, Linus, like all these guys are still continuing to pull more views per video year over year. Uh, they're not doing anything that different. It's like new iPhones are coming out, new laptops are coming out, new TVs are coming out. They're just sure. reviewing them. Yeah. But it seems like uh, the, the audience on YouTube is, is pr getting progressively older year over year. And like even my parents now go to YouTube and they watch technology videos because my dad wants to know like what phone he should buy next year. And so I, I still like, again, I would double down on YouTube. I will bet on YouTube over the next five years over any other social platform for that reason. But it is going to be a little bit of like chasing um, for a lot of creators who are wanting to pull 10 million plus views per video. There's not a lot of things you can do right now that have that virality. That that's legal to do, which which is which brings me into my um, evil Mr. Beast idea that I, oh, I want. Love this, yeah. So um, <laughs> so so part of the podcast that Matt and I did was I brought up the fact that there are great ideas that you can never do because they're pure evil and completely illegal and horrible. So um, I went to the trouble of making a thumbnail for one of them. So if you look up a couple of channels in the Discord, you'll see episode chat. If you could read, if you could click episode chat, I'm going to pop a, a thumb, thumbnail that I made in there. And then I want your reaction to my um, evil Mr. Beast video. Okay. Are you ready? This is Kevin's pitch. <laughs> All right. Hit me. This is my pitch to work for night media. <laughs> Let me see what this is. Painting the white house red oh, with baby yeah. blood. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, this, this, this video probably gets a hundred plus million views without question. Now, does it get monetized is the next question, which I would say is like equivocally no. I don't think there's any world this makes it through the you know checks and balances of YouTube monetization. I, I love the like evil Mr. Beast face though. Uh, yeah, the devil horns are nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope so. So yeah, the video is called painting the white house red with baby blood. And, um, and Jimmy is holding a, a paint roller with an infant on the uh, on, the, the infant is on <laughs> the infant is on the paint roller uh so you can tell that he's actually using the baby uh the bleeding baby to paint the white house red yeah. And uh, you went all out in detail with this. I, I love, I love the uh, like the random like uh, yellow arrow kind of pointing to the blood as well, like very, very mm -hmm. YouTube esque on the thumbnail optimization here. Yeah, you need to know this is like version six of this. Like there were many iterations <laughs> to get this right, um, and even the description helped me source newborns so that you know the, uh, there's some audience participation as well. 
I will um, say though, like uh, I I've, on the, the screenshot it says seventy million views in eleven days. I think that if, if we ever ended up posting a video like that, I think that would be a big disappointment. Only seventy million views in eleven days. On that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the final Mr. Beast video. He just ends on something <laughs> right. absolutely horrific and uh, <laughs> notoriety inducing. I do, I do read. I really like your point about uh, people who are watching content and, and increasing their expectations for uh, you know a little bit, a little bit crazier, a little more interesting. They're getting older. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point, you know. And as um, as uh, we were talking about uh, earlier, just some of the examples of uh, of, of the channels that you know, aren't insane but but do quite well there's a, a landscaping guy keith kelfus that i watch on youtube well i'm 40 years old you know and i've been in the game a little while i'm i'm interested in, i find it really interesting i don't want to start a landscaping business but i've gotten several tips about removing stumps and and equipment to use and all these things that i do outside i like watching it you know i like watching now even uh channels from uh from certain companies that that uh, it's like here's what you can do with this product like here's the tutorial on exactly how to use this type of uh, oil finish or paint or something like that i uh, well that that's what happens when you become elderly like kevin <laughs> you, you start to consume different types of media and that's what's that's what's going to happen you know you, you go through a shift uh into your 20s and 30s and all of that and as people get older, it's not like they want content any less. They don't. Mm -hmm. and, and many times they want even more. They just want a little different stuff. So, yeah, and Jen mentions in the episode chat, the, the cleaning thing. That's what sparked it. You talking yep. about the guy cleaning the houses. Uh, that's really intriguing content. Uh, there's, there's no end to the amazing ideas there. Um, it's fascinating stuff. And, and I, I feel... You know, I, I feel like uh, a lot of people need to relax about about their content ideas because they're trying to one up themselves constantly. And I get that. But when they really understand their audience, you can do some some pretty normalish things that are actually fascinating to the people who like you. Mm. Uh, and I, I really hope that that becomes more common as, as people do pull back a little bit uh, and, and bang out some incredible ideas that that on paper just don't seem quite as sexy, but they, but they are in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a lot of creators need to focus more. And this is like a, a little bit of a shot to the bigger creators. It seems like everyone's just chasing views and what they should be mm -hmm. doing is they should build, be building depth of community. Like, cause that, that's the ultimate goal is like have a community that is fostered that will support whatever you do. And I think that's like one thing that Nelk has done with their community. It's one thing that you know, Danny Duncan has done with his community is like, they don't pull 20 million views a video, but they have a tremendous amount of depth of people that will buy a ticket when they're on tour. They'll buy, you know, happy dad when it's at the convenience store, like they, they will go in droves to do whatever they can to support that individual creator. And so even if, if I was like to focus on content creation, I wouldn't be like, how do I just go get views? I would be like, how do I just build depth? How do I get the first 1000 fans to care? And then how do I get to 10,000 fans that care? And then ultimately, if you can get 100,000 people that really care and ride with you, that should be the ultimate goal. And you don't have to pull 10 million views of video to get there. And you can launch a lot of interesting products with 100,000, even 10,000, even 1,000 people that care about you. And so I, I hope that like people understand that because I think that the vanity metric that everyone is chasing right now is just views and subscribers. When like, if you're in this for decades, that stuff doesn't matter in the long run. If you're really in this for years and years and years, you want to like build something with true enterprise value and sustainability. And that comes from the depth of the community. Are there uh, actionable things that you've seen work that can translate to people um, to foster a depth of community? Yeah. I think it's just being true to yourself. I think there's a lot to be said about the authenticity of Dude Perfect and what they were doing early on and just mm -hmm. kind of being the five guys that lived with each other in college that made trick shots that then got an office, but continued to make trick shots. And I mean, there's the, like the realness of what Nelk does and like the, they're, they're who they are on camera and in real life. And so I, th I think just focusing on your, your true self and providing value, responding to people in the comments, showing them that you care, uh, doing community events. I think this is one thing that Eric has done really well is he's done a good job of 
of doing community events and he just did a pizza party and he's like he's trying to engage his audience to come together and give them opportunities to meet him and to you know buy his uh, I think it's like a pizza sauce or something like that that he's selling and so I, I think there is some big creators that are doing this incredibly well but it kind of all starts with just the the person is like can people really fall in love with you and are you authentically yourself or are you like playing this random character and so yeah I, I think you know hopefully a lot of creators that see this or you know hopefully other people talk about this but the the goal should be about community building the goal should not be to just pull views and i think that's where this got lost on tiktok is the metric became how many views can you pull on your tiktok it wasn't how can you foster people to care and then transition them over to youtube to also care even more to watch an eight minute video and it's like it got lost in translation on tiktok because everyone was chasing views because like the next trend was like a different dance And like everyone would have that dance and then they would pull a million views on that TikTok. What they didn't realize is like 999,000 of those people don't care. They're just watching you do the same trend that every other TikTok creator did, um, but they don't really care about who you are and what you're making and what you're all about. And a lot of storytelling channels are good at building this type of community. It seems like the the prank channels and the channels that appeal to 18 to 24 year olds are doing really well in community building. I mean, Emma Chamberlain, that's like core is like 16 to 20 year olds. Um, and she's really hit that because she's so authentically herself and she focuses on storytelling and, and being her true self. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's inspiring for me to watch. And that's like a lot of things that I focus on is like what creators are actually building community and what creators are just like pulling views. Yeah. This is going to be really reductive and unfair, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, it reminds me of uh, this question I just thought of. What's the most famous America's Funniest Home Video creator of all time? Oh, yeah. Who knows? No, I have there no is idea. not <laughs> one. No one knows. that, that It doesn't exist. Uh-huh. That's not a thing. No one remembers like, yeah. oh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, Peter Johnson uh, made that great, uh, you know, wiffle ball to the to the testicles video in 1991, and got really <laughs> famous after that. Like, no, that's not a thing, mm-hmm. and, and that's probably super. That's definitely super reductive of what you're talking about. But sometimes, you know, reducing conceptually, something yeah, conceptually, fine. yeah, to yeah. its purest essence, uh, can inform a point, and 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 perhaps it does with that. Um, what what I, I do. I, I want to point something out uh, uh, that that you said, Reed, about people being themselves, right? I, I know that a lot of smaller and uh, new creators don't think that they are interesting enough. You know, you are. You almost certainly are. And we've talked many times about how if you're really into something, that shows through in your content. Hey, other people will follow along even if they themselves are not into the thing you are. Right. Um, This is why I love Weird Paul, which, uh, by the way, he just got his marriage license today. He posted that on Twitter. uh, Guest Weird Paul from the past. Um, Congratulations to him. But he's excited about all the little things he buys at at flea markets and thrift stores. And, you know, it could be some goofy uh, comic from 1982. And he's really into it and it makes it good to watch. Well, he's himself. He's he's the same uh, on person as he is on camera. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and it, it makes it so much easier to make the content too when you're just doing what you do anyway, right? It's, uh, but but uh, not necessarily inventing this persona that uh, can can have certain attitudes and be a certain way and hit on certain topics. Like that's not that's not sustainable, you know. And you can get the views and you can hit crazy metrics with with some of that stuff, but people like seeing other people and who they really are. And, and you can become a fan of somebody when, when you see who they are. If you don't ever see them, you can't have any kind of attachment to them. Uh, so it's really quite useful to, to just plain be yourself a bit. Sorry, Kevin, I jumped in. No, no, no. Uh, I was going to do something super, super important and um, t- totally um, not sucking up at all. And that is Try my very first <laughs> Feastables oh. Mr. Beast chocolate bar. Oh. What is that? Milk live chocolate on the podcast. Uh, yeah, what flavor is that? This sea is salt chocolate, or milk chocolate? Sea salt. Yeah, dark chocolate. Okay, sea salt. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like the packaging. The design is is epic. Oh, it's good. It's the yeah the design. The website is amazing. Everything visually is mm-hmm. really good. Oh. See, I've I've never had one of these before. It's kind of like uh, yeah. So it has like out- a twin. If you pull out the whole mold, so so pull out the whole mold, there's like a share and devour. And so the idea was like, 
how do we convey like what Mr. Beast has done in the mold? And so if you look at the top, you can break off the share part right there uh, and give it to your friend, which was like kind of like our homage to like Jimmy's brand is like sharing your chocolate with someone else. And it has this kind of zigzag Twin Peaks mm-hmm. uh, red room floor to it too. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna snap the chocolate on the mic. Here we go. Oh, I hope everybody could hear that. <laughs> yeah. So this is oh, uh, delicious. This, this is sea salt. So it's a, it's a faint sea salt uh, in a dark chocolate bar. So we we launched three dark chocolate bars, and then we launched a milk chocolate and a sea salt. Uh, there may or may not be a few more bars coming out in Q1. Uh, you guys have to to hold on to see, but yeah, sea salt is one of our most popular, uh, bars at the moment. I can see why it's excellent. It's excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally, uh, food shopping the other day thinking about, well, I'm going to be talking to Reed in a couple of days. Why don't I buy one of these chocolate bars that he has been integral to, uh, putting out in the world. So, uh, how is that going? Is that, uh, been, uh, uh, has it uh, surpassed your expectations, met your expectations? What's uh, going on with that, with the fe- feastable stuff? I didn't really have a ton of expectations. I, I had an, We had an idea of what we wanted to do. Is like 50th anniversary of the original Willy Wonka movie. Wanted to do chocolate bars, but we wanted to launch something that was healthier for the consumers that only had five ingredients in it. Um, whereas like a Hershey bar has double that. And so we wanted to get it you know, source from an organic family owned cocoa farm. And there's like certain things that, that we wanted to do with the brand in terms of sales. This is weird, but we never had a sales target for the first year. We knew how many bars we were ordering and we knew what the first sweepstakes was, but there was never like a, we need to do X sales and we need to do X sales in the second year. It was more about like, how do we launch a product that Jimmy is happy and, and really proud of? And then how do we just build on top of that? And the Walmart relationship came shortly after. So it's in 4,700 Walmarts across America. Uh, I don't know how much I can say without the CEO getting mad at me, but there's a lot going on in the business right now in terms of retail distribution, uh, where it will be available not only in America, but also globally. And there's a lot of products that will be coming out in 2023 that I can't speak about because I think Jimmy would get upset and I'll let him break all that news when he wants to. But I think the the core (laughs) thesis of the business is going to continue for why we started it, which was how do we build a better for you snacks brand that is mass market, that is incredibly creative, that can compete with the incumbents at the top that we think that over the next you know five to 10 years can continue to build a portfolio of products that are all better than their alternatives. And hopefully Gen Z really gravitates towards that. And they taste good. They have minimal ingredients, uh, which has always kind of been where we wanted to plant our foot in the ground on this thing. And so it's been a lot of fun. I I'm starting to do a lot of travel for meetings that we have and the team, the Feastables team is getting massive. Uh, I think we're, we have 35 people uh, currently that are just Feastables. Probably by the end of this year, we'll probably be in the sixties to seventies. Uh, and so it's something that Jimmy and I focus on quite a bit. Um, and we're, we're excited about all the products that are coming out, the CEO. And I think this is like important to understand is when you launch a creator business, most creators want to be the CEOs. I think one thing that Jimmy and I fully understood from the beginning is like, we need to go find a CEO, a true operator of this snacks company that's thinking about this every single day. That is not Jimmy. It's not myself. Jimmy and I can be on the board and we can be as supportive as possible. But ultimately, the success of this company is not just on the shoulders of him and I. We have a team of people. And so the former president of RX Bar, Jim Murray, is our CEO in Feastables. And we took other executives from RX Bar and a bunch of other brands that exist um, that have done well in the past. And so that was the idea is like, not only do we want, we have the vision for the company, but we also need the team. And this kind of goes back to YouTube is like, you can't do everything yourself. We understood that like this company can't be successful and can't get to as big as we hope it can get to without amazing people that work for the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's exciting to see where everything will go. And that's really kind of like the last question that I wanted to ask before we throw um, some questions at you from our patrons. And that's just about the future of Night Media. I mean, I've I've heard you speak in the past about how you want it to be way bigger than it is today. You want to compete with the WMEs and the CAAs of the world. Um, But the interview I saw with you kind of left it at that. So I'd love to hear, you know, sort of more about... Yeah. what you're thinking night media looks like 10 years from now. Oh man. I, I don't even, I'm not even confident. I know what night media looks like two years from now. I do know that I created night 
because it's something that I want to do with the rest of my life. Like I, I enjoy what I do every single day. I'm a talent representative. We also have a venture capital fund so I can invest in companies. We have a labs business, which is essentially like a company incubator that Feastables came out of and Rare Candy came out of. So I get to like scratch my like entrepreneurial startup itch whenever I want to be involved in those businesses. And then we announced Knight Capital, which was our $100 million PE fund, because we also want to start buying businesses. I think if we could go back in time and buy a snacks business and roll Jimmy on the cap table of that, instead of taking two and a half years to to build Feastables, it probably would have been a better outcome for us quickly. And so, yeah, it's it's something that I am truly passionate about running for a long period of time. I think for us to be able to compete with the big agencies in the industry and the big management companies, it's going to take decades. Like these, these companies are not like night media is not like a venture scale business. We can't just go raise venture capital and just acquire businesses and bring them in because a lot of times these businesses are built on trust. Um, they're built on relationships and like, you can't usually venture scale those things. And so it's something that I will continue to probably do for years to come. And I think if, you know, one thing that we're really focused on is like, what does the next generation of creator look like? How, how are they going to grow on YouTube? Is YouTube set up for them to have success? And what does that look like? Is it starting with YouTube shorts and then pivoting to, to long form video? And so the talent management department, uh, department is like our core business. And I think will always be our core business because without creators, night doesn't exist. And so hopefully we can continue to foster and help the next generation of global superstars and I, and I truly believe like more people are thinking very seriously about digital. I know 20 years ago, the end game was like, be an actor and actress and act in major studio films. I'm fully convinced the end game is way different now. The end game is like, grow an audience on the internet, own everything, own your IP, own your content, create your own consumer brands, create your own media, and like be, be your own individualized media company. So the end goal is completely changed. And I think Knight is at the forefront of that, that shift that is going on in the industry right now. And so I will continue and we will continue as Knight to double down on that. That is, um, that's where we're pretty focused. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right, Matt, you want to uh, throw some, some patron questions at Reed? I do. We'll keep them brief too, yeah, hit me. Uh, cause uh, we want to. We want to get you out of here. And uh, one of them is, is a bit of a longer answer, too. So the first one is is the shorty. It's from the world is ending and I'm late for work. It's good to see uh, them back in uh, the episode chat. This is, this is about monetization and content. Do you think that the content on YouTube is going to become too sterile with uh, increasing demonetization? And some of our guests in the past, um, Rusty Cage is a good example. He's building a lemonade stand that isn't it could probably chop lemons uh, but if you follow him on twitter then you know what he's really building Uh, really cool stuff great content that there's no way it's even going to be a yellow symbol so do you think this is going to have an effect on how people make content going forward do i do i think um youtube demonetizing demonetization yeah yeah, being stricter about about what gets full monetization. It feels like they've kind of backed off from a lot of the strict monetization features of the past. Do you guys remember like four years ago, if you swore in a video, your video would get flagged and it would have to get manually reviewed. Now mm-hmm. it's like we have a lot of creators that swear a lot in every single video and they're instantly green. And so the, the demonetization has gotten a lot better. I think their AI has gotten better at scraping videos and seeing like what is bad and what isn't. They also have a new system where they manually review a lot of videos, at least the, the, the bigger channels too. The bigger channels, like they, everything gets manually reviewed as soon as you upload it unlisted. And so one, one trick that, that we've learned that YouTube's very upfront about is like, if you're a creator that always has your videos demonetized, I know this sucks, but like upload your video and let it sit unlisted for a, like a day. And then if it gets yellow, then ask for a manual review. That way you save yourself from uploading this video that is then turns yellow right as you upload it. And then it already gets manually reviewed. So it's green and then you can upload it. I've seen a lot of creators focus on doing that. So they basically will put a a video up every Tuesday on their channel and they won't upload it until like Wednesday night. Um, So they'll give it room to breathe. They'll let YouTube's like AI or an individual review it and then they'll upload it. But it seems like YouTube is like now figured out what should and shouldn't be demonetized. And I haven't seen a lot of creators like bitching about this online as much. I think three, four years ago, it seemed like Twitter every single day was like some creator yelling about how they had a video demonetized. And so it just it feels like they're 
their system has gotten a lot better. So it's not something that I worry about at all. And and we we represent some channels who are very on edge. I mean, you guys said Schlatt um, went to TCU. Like I would say Schlatt is on the line um, to like videos that if you had <laughs> uploaded them four years ago would have been instant demonetized. Now it's like he doesn't get a lot of videos demonetized that he uploads. No, that's uh, that's a good point that it is getting better. And yeah, you were right. Every day was like an advocacy campaign for some uh, creator yeah. on Twitter who who got smoked, uh, you know, unjustly. There, there's also um, a lot so more. Next, um, oh, just yeah, a, a second answer on this. There's also a lot more alternative monetization on YouTube that didn't exist four years ago. And so, if you're a creator that's like, I'm just going to produce nelk like content and youtube's going to demonetize everything then figure out where else you're going to focus to make money is that merchandise is that uh, memberships which is on youtube is that donations there's a lot of different alt monetization things available to creators to combat against the demonetization and not having ad sets yeah i like that and that's important too and and people are saying uh you know patreon in the chat yeah. stuff like that like yeah there are a lot of avenues now where you can consistently produce content without without worrying too much about uh what adsense is going to do you don't have to sink or swim by that um uh let me see the next one is from triple question mark what do you consider to be and how do you find a good balance between quantity and quality and this is the thing that that like literally all of us are are trying to sort out is uh, at what point uh, are you spending so much time on quality that you're not uploading frequently enough? And at what point is it uh, the other way? How do you find the balance? Oh man, it's like, it's, it's so creator to creator. Uh, I, I would say that more than not, um, a couple of years ago, every creator was posting too much. Um, and I remember when I first got in this industry in 2013, 2014, there was gaming creators that were posting three times a day. They were making three Minecraft videos every single day. And, and Lanky Box still does this. This is their strategy is like three to four videos a day. And it does really well for them. So it's hard for me to be like, okay, um, post less videos that get more views when like they're demonstrating that like posting three times a day is working because they're pulling a billion views a month. Whereas like a Jimmy is posting once a month um, with the same, they're like getting the same amount of views and they have completely different strategies. So it's, it's so creator to creator. Um, and it's like so subjective based on what industry you're in because i think the tech creators it's so based on like new products coming out uh i i do think a lot of creators over obsess with edits now is like you, a lot of them don't like get it to 80 to 90 percent where it's like it can go at the door a lot of them will like obsess over it and then it goes out a week late i probably see that the most is like a little bit of like over obsession on edits um but again like so, some creators don't need to post that often there's now uh, you used to be rewarded on YouTube for posting daily content, like being fully consistent on the platform. It's not like that anymore. Like videos are all judged individually. It all comes down to, do, are people watching this video and are people clicking on this video? And if they're doing those two things, it'll get suggested and more people will see that video. You know, three, four years ago, it wasn't like that. If you, you know, were, were missing a day of vlogging, I know Logan and Jake Paul were like, I don't know, 500 days of consistent vlogs. The argument was if they miss a day, they're going to lose momentum. But this is no longer a momentum game. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to answer without knowing the like specific niche or like genre that the content is in. Yeah, it does seem very fluid, and and some video like I, I don't. I'm not uh, negging on the Minecraft people, uh, but you can make three Minecraft videos a day. You can't make three Vsauce videos no. a day. You know, so yeah. it, it, it's just not practical, well, like in, in terms of how these videos. Yeah, happen. I mean, it's the same like every science channel. Like I know I complain about this, the like science channels all the time because that's the type of content I like to consume. I would want nothing more than for Mark Rober to upload 24 videos a year. I just know it's not <laughs> it's not feasible because I know how much goes in to his, each and one, each one of his videos. Same with like Michael Reeves. Yeah, this was like the first time Michael had uploaded in like four months, but it's like he was he was focused on boxing. If, if, if his videos take a month of, of prep to, to do that and he's like focused on something else, then videos just aren't going to get uploaded. So yeah, it's, it's very dependent on, on the channel and like what space it's in. Well, I, I want to end the patri uh, patron questions with, with a big one that I'm going to extend. So Ducky uh, is a YouTube creator, very, very good, and one of the most thoughtful people in the Discord server. And uh, Ducky asks about what you look for uh, in terms of qualities for somebody to work with. And I want to extend this question and, and ask not only is like, what's the one thing that you really want to see and need to see to work with somebody, but what's the ultimate red flag? What do you see and think 
they're not going to make it or they can't do it with us. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you guys a few red flags. Um, I think one, um, I, I used to say lack of confidence, but it feels like creators continue to mature. And I've seen a lot of creators have a, a deep lack of confidence that have eventually just broken through and had a lot of success. One, one of the, t- the biggest red flags, I think, in my position, just as a talent representative, and we just kind of call it clean kitchen. And what I mean by that is like, there's not a lot of like decision makers and like people clouding what's happening. Uh, a good example is like, okay, creator A is, you know, it's, he has a team of three people, but he also has like mom and dad are involved and like uncle Billy's involved. And like, he has this like lawyer who like wants to be the agent manager is involved. And it's like very clouded. That's like a no go. That's like a no go zone for us. Uh, it's just like life's too short. We need like direct lines of communication to creator, and we need the creator to be able to make the decision. Because a lot of times we need we need like quick decisions to be made. But if it's like now you have six different people that have all their opinions, and then everyone needs to be heard. We've just had so many bad situations um, when people haven't had a clean kitchen. I would say is like in my position as a talent representative, that's like the biggest red flag. And, and also as a creator too, you want a clean kitchen. Like you want to be able to, you want people to be able to ask questions to and be like, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? You don't want a ton of people that think they have the control. Uh, and that's usually what ends up happening. And it's, it's most of the time it's younger creators. And I totally get it. If you're 17 years old, like mom and dad need to be involved. And like, there's probably going to be a ton of people. But at some point you sign with a talent representative because you trust them to help guide you through your career. But if you can't fully trust them and you have all these other people, then you probably just shouldn't sign a manager and an agent, your parents or uncle or whoever that person is should just do it. All right. Well, uh, there is one more question, actually, that I need to ask you. It's a question that we end every podcast with, and it is this. What makes an interesting person? What makes an interesting person? I think I, I'm, I can just answer this from like what makes interesting people that I gravitate towards. I gravitate towards passion. It doesn't matter what that passion is for. It can be for content creation. It can be for farming. I, I'm really drawn to people that I, I can just feel the passion coming out of them. And I think a lot of the most successful creators, you can feel that passion. I, I'm also really drawn to people that are obsessed with like just continuing to learn and be knowledgeable. Uh, there's not like a, a complacency about them where they feel like they've made it and they can no longer learn anything from anyone. A lot of the people that I spend most of my time with are like very curious. Uh, so they're, they're always asking questions. They meet someone that's in some genre that they don't understand and they'll just be uniquely just curious about what, what that is and, and how did you get started? And so the, those are the people that, you know, I think I gravitate towards. And I, I think a lot of our creators and a lot of the people I spend a lot of time with kind of embody those two things. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, look, I, uh, I u- usually like to like plug. Our, our guests at this point of the podcast, but what in the world do <laughs> watch, I plug for you, man? Like, watch, watch YouTube, watch yeah, YouTube. I, and if you watch for 20 minutes, you'll find a video that he's involved I'm, in. Um, I launched a channel. So th- this is, I, I want to show people like what the behind the scenes kind of looks like in a talent representative. And so the, the channel is just called like Read D. And I've posted a few videos. One was like my reaction to Colin and Samir's like Mr. Beast Burger video because that was such a big moment. I posted a behind the scenes of like Jimmy doing a bunch of podcasts with like Nelk and Cody Co and all that stuff. So I, I, I don't see enough of this content of like, what is the business aspect of this look like? Um, and so hopefully like people can find a little bit of that in the channel. And so I guys, I probably won't post a lot of videos. It just is what it is. I got a lot of shit going on. Um, but if I post 12 to 15 videos a year, we won. And hopefully those 12 to 15 videos spark the next generation of talent managers and representatives and YouTubers. And that's, that's kind of the goal. And so, yeah, um, if you guys want to check that out, I only have a a few long form videos on there, but yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll post more in the coming months. I will say that following you on LinkedIn has been really excellent. I only read the posts from like three to four people on that platform because it's all, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of self. It's a lot of self promotion. <laughs> That's like one thing Link, LinkedIn's yeah, got to yeah. clean up a little bit. Is like the self promotion should just get shadow banned at a certain point, and like the interesting yes. stuff should rise to the top. And so, I, I LinkedIn has a lot of work to do on how they help creators be successful on the platform. And I think like they're going to have to get past this like self promotion versus knowledge and like yeah. So I, I don't know how they're going to do it, but I, I love LinkedIn. So I appreciate you saying that. So 
it's it's a big focus of ours is like just consistently throwing out like stuff and and helping like educate people on certain industries yeah it's all very real you know real and applicable so it's good yeah. stuff well i appreciate you guys this is this has been a lot of fun Awesome. Thanks. And we, I do have something to plug. Check out Read D. Uh, watch the videos. Um, I hope that everybody enjoyed this episode. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash the create unknown. We'll be back next Tuesday with another guest. Really looking forward to that. Uh, Read, again, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Uh, this was great. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks, patrons, for hanging out. And uh, we'll see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. Thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan the Latch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Risebread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Jelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71.